Snoozecast, the podcast designed to help you fall asleep. Find us on snoozecast.com and follow us on Instagram at snoozecast to find behind the scenes content. If you enjoy our show, please write a review on the Apple Podcasts app. Also, share us with a friend. If you'd like to get an email once a week with upcoming sleep stories and other news, Subscribe to the newsletter at snoozecast.com. This episode is brought to you by our Patreon supporters and by Bowery Hollows. Tonight, we'll read The Trees of Paradise, an excerpt from Plant Lore, Legends, and Lyrics by Richard Fulkerd. Let's get cozy. Close your eyes. Relax your body into the softness of your bed. Now, take a few deep breaths. Amongst all peoples and in all ages, there has lingered a belief possessing peculiar powers of fascination that in some unknown region, remote and unexplored, there existed a glorious and happy land, a land of sunshine, luxuriance, and plenty, a land of stately trees and beauteous flowers, a terrestrial paradise, a tradition contained in the sacred books of the Parsis states that at the beginning of the world, or must, the giver of all good, created the primal steer, which contained the germs of all the animals. Ahriman, the evil spirit, then created venomous animals, which destroyed the steer. While dying, there sprang out of his right hip the first man, and out of his left hip, the first man's soul. From him arose a tree, whence came the original human pair, namely, Masha and Mashoi, who were placed in Hedon, a delightful spot where grew home the tree of life, the fruit of which gave vigor and immortality. This paradise was in Iran. The woman, being persuaded by Araman in the guise of a serpent, gave her husband fruit to eat, which was destructive. The Persians also imagined a paradise on a mountain. The Arabians conceived an Elysium in the midst of the desert. The pagan Scandinavians sang of the holy city situated in the center of the world. 
the Celts believed an earthly paradise to exist in the enchanted island of Avalon, the island of the blessed, where falls not hail or rain or any snow, nor even wind blows loudly, but it lies deep meadowed, happy, fair, with orchard lawn and bowery hollows. The Greeks and Romans pictured to themselves the delightful gardens of the Hesperides, where grew the famous trees that produced apples of gold. And in the early days of Christendom, the poets of the West dreamt of a land in the East, the true paradise of Adam and Eve, as they believed, in which dwelt in a palm tree the golden-breasted phoenix, the bird of the sun, which was thought to abide a hundred years in this Elysium of the Arabian deserts, and then to appear in the temple of the sun at Heliopolis, fall upon the blazing altar, and pouring forth a melodious song from or through its feathers, which thus formed a thousand organ pipes. It cremated, only to rise again from its smoking ashes and fly back to its home in the palm tree of the earthly paradise. The Russians tell of a terrestrial paradise to be sought for on the island of Bujan, where grows the vast oak tree, amidst whose majestic branches the sun nestles to sleep every evening, and from whose summit he rises every morning. The Hindu religion shadows forth an Elysium on Mount Meru, on the confines of Kashmir and Tibet. The garden of the great Indian god Indra is a spot of unparalleled beauty. Here are to be found a grove of trees where the gods delight to take their ease cooling fountains and rivulets, an enchanting flower garden, luminous flowers, immortalizing fruits and brilliantly plumed birds whose melody charms the gods themselves. In this paradise, are fine trees, which were the first things that appeared above the surface of the troubled waters at the beginning of the creation. From these trees drop the immortalizing ambrosia. The principal tree is the parijata the flower of which preserves its perfume all the year round, combines in its petals every odor and every flavor, presents to each his favorite color and most esteemed perfume, and procures happiness for those who ask it. But beyond this, it is a token of virtue, 
losing its freshness in the hands of the wicked, but preserving it with the just and honorable. This wondrous flower will also serve as a torch by night and will emit the most enchanting sounds, producing the sweetest and most varied melody. It assuages hunger and thirst, cures diseases, and remedies the ravages of old age. The Paradise of Mohammed is situated in the seventh heaven. In the center of it stands the marvelous tree called Tuba, which is so large that a man mounted on the fleetest horse could not ride round its branches in one hundred years. This tree not only affords the most grateful shade over the whole extent of the paradise, but its boughs are laden with delicious fruits of a size and taste unknown to mortals, and moreover bend themselves at the wish of the inhabitants of this abode of bliss to enable them to partake of these delicacies without any trouble. The rivers of paradise also add greatly to the delights. All these rivers take their rise from the tree Tuba. Some flow with water, some with milk, some with honey, and others even with wine, the juice of the grape not being forbidden to the blessed. We have seen how the most ancient races conceived and cherished the notion of a paradise of surpassing beauty, situated in remote and unknown regions, both celestial and terrestrial. It is not, therefore, surprising that the paradise of the Hebrews, the Mosaic Eden, should have been pictured as a luxuriant garden, stocked with lovely flowers and wonderful herbs, and shaded by majestic trees of every description. We are told in the second chapter of Genesis that at the beginning of the world, the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and that out of this country of Eden, a river went out to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. These heads, or rivers, are further on in the biblical narrative. Many have been speculations as to the exact site and geographical features of Eden and the divinely planted paradise in its midst, and the subject has been one which has ever been fruitful of controversy and conjecture. Terrestrial paradise, as wise men say, 
is the highest place of earth, that is, in all the world, and it is so high that it toucheth nigh to the circle of the moon, for it is so high that the flood of Noah might never come to it, albeit it did cover all the earth of the world, all about, and above and beneath, save paradise alone. And this paradise is enclosed all about with a wall, and men do not know where it is, for the walls be covered all over with moss, as it seems. And it seems not that the wall is stone of nature, and that wall stretches from the south to the north, and it hath not but one entry that is closed with fire burning, so that no man that is mortal dare not enter. And in the highest place of paradise, exactly in the middle, is a well that casts out the four streams which run by diverse lands, the first of which is called Ganges, that runs through India. The other is called Nile, which goes through Ethiopia. The other is called Tigris, which runs by Assyria and by Armenia the Great and the other is called Euphrates, which runs through Armenia and Persia. And men there beyond say that all the sweet waters of the world, above and beneath, take their beginning from the well of paradise and out of the well all waters come and go. Eden, a Hebrew word signifying pleasure, it is generally conceded, was the most beauteous and luxuriant portion of the world, and the Garden of Eden the paradise of Adam and Eve was the choicest and most exquisite portion of Eden. As regards the situation of this terrestrial paradise, the biblical narrative distinctly states that it was in the East but various have been the speculations as to the precise locality. Moses, in writing of Eden, probably contemplated the country watered by the Tigris and Euphrates, the land of the mighty city of Babylon. Many traditions confirm this view. Not only were there a district called Eden and a town called Paradisus in Syria, a neighboring country to Mesopotamia, but in Mesopotamia itself there is a certain region which, as late as the year 1552 was called Eden. Some would localize the Eden of Scripture near Mount Lebanon in Syria. Others, 
between the rivers of Tigris and Euphrates to the west of Babylon, others again in the delightful plains of Armenia or in the highlands of Armenia where the Tigris and Euphrates have their rise. An opinion very generally held is that Eden was placed at the junction of several rivers on a site which is now swallowed up by the Persian Gulf and that it never existed after the deluge which effaced this paradise from the face of earth. Another theory places Eden in a vast central portion of the globe, comprising a large piece of Asia and a portion of Africa, the four rivers being the Ganges, the Tigris, the Euphrates, and the Nile before the flood. There was, in connection with this garden, to the east of it, a gate and a flaming sword guarding this gate and a way to the tree of life. On that very spot, I believe the great pyramid of Egypt to be built to mark where the face of God shone forth to man before the flood. And the flood, by changing the land surface through the changing of the ocean bed, changed the center somewhat and threw it further south. It is the very center of the earth now where the pyramid stands and marks the place where the gate of Eden was before the flood. The Tree of Life Whatever may have been the site of the land of Eden or pleasure, Moses, in describing paradise, as its garden, doubtless wish to convey the idea of a sanctuary of delight and primal loveliness. Indeed, he tells us that out of the ground made the good Lord grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. This paradise was in the middle of Eden, and in the middle of paradise was planted the tree of life, and close by the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Into this garden the Lord put the man whom he had formed to dress and to keep it. In other words, to till, plant, and sow. In the very center of paradise, in the midst of the land of Eden, grew the tree of life. Now, what was this tree? Various have been the conjectures with regards to its nature. Some traditions make the tree of life a supernatural tree, resembling the world or cloud trees of the Scandinavians and Hindus and bearing a striking resemblance to the tuba of the Mohammedan paradise. 
they describe the tree of life as being of enormous bulk, towering far above all others, and so vast in its girth that no man, even if he lived so long, could travel round it in less than five hundred years. From beneath the colossal base of this stupendous tree gushed all the waters of the earth by whose instrumentality nature was everywhere refreshed and invigorated. Regarding the rabbinic traditions as purely mythical, certain commentators have regarded the tree of life as typical only of that life and the continuous nature of it which our first parents derived from God. Others think that it was called the tree of life because it was a memorial, pledge, and seal of the eternal life which had man continued in obedience would have been his reward in the paradise above. Others, again, believe that the fruit of it had a certain vital influence to cherish and maintain man in immortal health and vigor till he should have been translated from the earthly to the heavenly paradise. As Eden occupied the center of the world and the tree of life was planted in the middle of Eden, that spot marked the very center of the world and it was necessary that he who was the life of mankind should die in the center of the world and act from the center. Hence, the tree of life destroyed at the flood on account of man's wickedness was replaced on the same spot. Adam was told he might eat freely of every tree in the garden, excepting only the tree of knowledge. We may, therefore, suppose that he would be sure to partake of the fruit of the tree of life, which, from its prominent position in the midst of the garden, would naturally attract his attention. Like the sacred Soma tree of the Hindus, the tree of life probably yielded heavenly ambrosia and supplied to Adam food that invigorated and refreshed him with its immortal sustenance. So long as he remained in obedience, he was privileged to partake of this glorious food. But when he disobeyed the divine command and partook of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, he was no longer fit to taste the immortal ambrosia 
of the tree of life. Some have claimed that the banana was the tree of life and that another species of the tree was the tree of knowledge. Others consider that the Indian sacred fig tree, the ficus religiosa, the Hindu world tree was the tree of life, which grew in the middle of Eden.